Welcome to the BV Magazine podcast, your genuine slice of rural Dorset life. This is episode one for March 2023, and it's hello from me, Terry Bennett. And hello from me, Jenny Devitt. In this episode, we'll have a selection of your letters to the editor. Simon Hoare welcomes the recently agreed Windsor framework and hopes that this will have a wider benefit for the ongoing UK-EU relationship. Mike Chapman of the Lib Dems writes about the cost of living. Ken Huggins asks us to take a closer look at the investment policies of our pension funds. And Labour's Pat Osborne compares Labour's five missions with Sunak's five pledges. Local shepherd Bonnie Craddock shares her favourite music with us in Dorset Island Discs. And we gain an insight into the rare ancient skill of horse logging. But first, here's Laura Hitchcock. Today I popped down the garden and I paused for a second because there it was, that inescapable, inevitable scent on the wind. Spring. It wasn't a conscious choice, but my mood immediately lifted. I took a few moments to smile at a suspicious robin who was waiting for me to leave. This winter has been so very long, endlessly, ploddingly, dully long, but you can't keep a good year down. And as the days lengthen, our gloomy, northern-dwelling brains, despite their best grumbling intentions, will start to feel that positivity that comes simply from a little brightness in the day. Sometimes you just have to stop thinking so much about how wretched the world is and just feel the spring. We've had long conversations with our son in America today as he tussles between two excellent job offers, one with a stellar global company but a rigid, restrictive work routine, the other with a young company without the name, the recognition or the stability but all the flexibility and autonomy he could desire. Ultimately, his decision won't be made in a neatly thoughtful pros and cons list. He'll simply go with which feels right, and rightly so. Our front cover isn't necessarily the most technically perfect image that was in our submissions this month, but that happy, pollen-coated, fat little bee with his foolishly dangling legs gave us both that same warmth of optimism that a little sunshine in March brings. He's heading down to just one more sticky yellow crocus stamen like it's a packet of chocolate digestives that it's frankly rude to say no to. It's perfect. It feels right. If you get a chance to flick through the magazine itself this month, the highlights for me are the country living focus on Toby Hode, the horse logger, the weirdly interesting insight into where our rubbish goes, and if you never venture as far as the health columns, you shouldn't miss Karen Geary's comments around the news that our GPs will be mass prescribing statins. As you'd expect, she has some thoughts. And finally, in a bit of a scoop by Edwina, the BV can give you a tour of some of the wonderful art inside the Red House. Yes, you're going to need to look at the magazine for this one. It's the winner of the Royal Institute of Architects Prize for the UK's best new architect-designed house, and it's nestled in the rolling hills just south of Shaftesbury. Enjoy March, and don't forget to go outside and lift your face up to feel the sunshine when it shows up. Letters to the Editor And this one is from John Reed of Shaftesbury regarding second home owners. As I write this, I note that Dorset Council has just voted through the additional levy on second home owners. Thank goodness. Second homes are the death by a thousand cuts for any small community. And it's no good a holiday home owner suggesting that they contribute to the local economy. Of course you do, but nowhere near as much as a family who work locally, attend school, shop, use the GP and pharmacy, etc. It's a nonsense argument. At the end of the day, if you can afford a second home, you can afford a little more tax on it to aid the community you're stripping of an asset. Terry's interview with Councillor Peter Wolfe on the podcast was an excellent follow-up to last month's article. I urge others to go and listen to it. And thank you, John. That's much appreciated. Suzanne Webb writes in by email about the original Blackmore Vale magazine. She writes... I saw a mention in a recent article about being printed since 2020 and could only think you referred to your own tenure of the BVM. In 1987, it was recommended to me by a local while I was searching for a place to live in North Dorset. It was packed with useful information and, in fact, led to my finding a home. It provided details of employment, local events, council activity and much, much more over the years. I think it deserves a bit of a drum roll for a lengthy and informative history. And the editor replies, This question is raised frequently. You might like to read the article we wrote in November 2020 to clear up the confusion. 
It may also interest you to know that we're very proud to have the long-time editor of the original BVM, Fanny Charles, and equally long-serving Dorset journalist Gay Piri Weir as sub-editors. Stephen Boyce of Monhull writes as follows. The arrogance of developers and their agents is breathtaking. Despite approval in recent months for nearly 300 homes, Monhull is once again having to resist a major planning application on a greenfield site. But the applications and supporting documents submitted are an insult to the intelligence of local people. Quite apart from the skewed arguments in favour of sustainable development and enhanced biodiversity, the casual incompetence of professional consultants beggars belief. Out-of-date plans and photos, inaccurate measurements and incorrect statements abound. It's evident that basic research has not been carried out and that no site visit has occurred. On one recent application, a consultant rerouted a public footpath through our garden and across the patio. You couldn't make it up, except they do as a result of cynical, sloppy and unprofessional practice. It's bad enough to impose unwanted, unnecessary and excessive expansion on the rural community, with all the harm to the landscape and environment that implies, but to do so with such incompetence adds insult to injury. On the flood at Borton Further to Roger Guttridge's The Day the Dam Burst, the BV magazine, February 23, we live right next to the dam in question on the road to Gasper, and I'm pleased to say that A. it looks very solid, and B. there is a very effective runoff system now. The lake is drained every year to manage fish stocks, and there's a plaque on the dam commemorating the events of that night. And that's from Nick Allett via Facebook. Iris Bell, near Blandford, wrote for Barry and Pete. She says, I just wanted to write and thank Barry Calf and Pete Harkham for their gardening columns. I don't even grow veg except for a few tomatoes, but I never miss Barry's column, much as I never miss Gardener's World. I enjoy the gentle, calm tone and the obvious experience and passion that comes through his words. Who knows, maybe I'll plant some carrots this year just to join in. And Pete's column always has a couple of jobs for me to get on with. Despite not having a huge garden, I do love to keep on top of it. His timely reminders on a Friday always give me a task for the weekend ahead. Could you thank them both for me and tell them they're much appreciated? Politics. Simon Hoare, MP, writes as follows. I'm sure many of you are slightly weary of news, comment and discussion of the Northern Ireland Protocol. You will, I hope, however, forgive me for taking a keen interest in this matter. As chairman of the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee, it does go with the territory. We've just had the announcement of the Windsor Framework, the updated and revised operational requirements of the protocol. The changes which have been agreed are excellent news for the people and economy of Northern Ireland. They are also good news for those businesses across the UK, including here in Dorset, who sell to Northern Ireland. However, there are some other benefits to this week's announcements which I believe are worth highlighting. The first is that it begins a new volume in the relationship of the UK and the EU. We've left the EU, but too many people were picking at the scab that wanted to heal. Windsor cauterises that wound. The UK remains a European country. Our nearest and largest trading market is Europe. The horrors of Ukraine have broadly united European countries, not just in collective condemnation, but collegiate actions. This, of itself, has served as a reminder of our shared principles and values. With this improved relationship, I think we can have legitimate expectations that we are in a better place with the French government and that a more collaborative approach to breaking the channel people traffickers is in prospect. Membership of Horizon is also there for the taking of strategic benefit to our strong and growing pharmaceutical, technological and scientific communities. This will help Europe PLC face into the powerful competition of Asia and the US. With that newly forged relationship also lies the hope that it will be easier for musicians and artists to be able to perform across the EU without recourse to the current visa bureaucracy. All of the above are placed within touching distance simply by resolving the protocol issues. Now, we must not fall into the trap of believing that it was inevitable. It wasn't. It took the new type of politics of the government and the Prime Minister. Gone is the bellicose, flippant, impatient cakeism to be replaced by the calm and the respectful. 
The magic ingredient in politics, as in so much else in life, is trust. No trust, no progress. Recent events have only been able to come about because of mutual respect, politeness, seriousness of purpose, attention to detail and calm advocacy have been restored. Improved Anglo-Irish and Anglo-French relations were prerequisites for progress and Rishi Sunak and his ministers quickly saw these as pivotal actions upon which they have delivered. The dropping of the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, which rode a coach and horses through our international legal obligations, is another important step in restoring the UK's reputation as being a country that keeps its words. That long-standing and hard-earned reputation is a vital foundation stone of the City of London and our place as a leading global financial centre, which of itself contributes such a lot to the Treasury and the funding of our public services. Now, I supported Rishi Sunak from the get-go, so of course I would be accused of some bias. However, I think even the most sceptical observer would have to admit that his seriousness of purpose, his politeness and his attention to detail can and will pay dividends for our country. As one of my American political friends said to me recently, it's so good to have the UK we all know, love and respect back in the room. Mike Chapman of the Lib Dems writes... The big issues of the week leading up to this month's BV publication have been the Windsor framework and the cost of living, neatly expressed in the price of gas and electricity. As a Lib Dem, my instincts are to head for the common ground, find the right balance, seek fairness and a basis for sustainable future growth. Why? Well, mostly because I've seen and felt the effects of a lack of compromise and misplaced ideology. July 1972 saw me volunteering at a camp for troubled kids, in inverted commas, from Belfast. On our last evening around a campfire, we heard of the deaths and injuries of some of their friends from a wave of attacks on the streets of their city. Five years later found me in a flat in Madrid, 15 yards from where terrorists chose to put a bomb in the gateway to a government building. I remember thinking as I briefly sailed through the air towards the wall on the far side of my bedroom, it's the weekend, for Christ's sake. Neither event was justifiable, not remotely justifiable. Both, though, were born of age-old repression and a lack of hope, coupled with excess zeal and misplaced ideology. Woe betide the DUP if they prolong the current standoff. Sir Ed Davies' call for further strong support for families and businesses in the face of continuing high gas and electricity prices is spot on. There will be those abstract-minded mandarins in the Treasury who believe that the nation will soon adjust to a new normal, just as it has done with £10 for a packet of cigarettes, £5 for a pint, and around £1.50 per litre for petrol. We will all be praised for the environmentally sound principle of giving up non-essential energy use, when the truth is that using less is becoming the only way of affording what we need. The proliferation of prepayment meters further drives a hand-to-mouth existence for too many, especially those on low and or fixed incomes. The original price hike was the driver of inflation, Time alone solves the inflation percentage, even if prices stay high. A pyrrhic victory for Rishi, if ever there was one. No, the government can and must act to resolve the way in which energy from fixed cost sources, such as hydro, nuclear, wind and solar, is only viable at the same rate as that produced by fossil fuels, themselves price hiked by Putin's grotesque war of conquest. Remember, the typical U.S. electricity price is about half what it is in the U.K. The price in France is only a little more than the U.S. price. So, less wringing of hands and bleating that you can't beat the market, please. Let's see some action, some fairness, and less of a blight on opportunity. And now from Ken Huggins of the Green Party. Attempting to tidy my overburdened desk recently, I discovered a copy of Ethical Customer magazine. The cover picture showed a Lego family standing on top of our planet, which was shaped like a piggy bank and stained with oil. The child was asking, Mum and Dad, are your savings messing up my future? Above the headline was, Can your pension and investments help to fight climate change? 
The magazine was dated spring 2014, and the article on ethical banks scored Barclays the worst of all. In 2023, they are still bumping along the bottom, with an ethical score of 2 out of 20 points. I have now finally closed my long-held Barclays account. Better late than never. My pension fund is ranked second best for ethics, but it still only scores 10 out of 20 points, so the pension industry clearly has a long way to go. An October 2021 report found that the UK pensions industry enables more CO2 emissions worldwide than all the UK's carbon emissions put together. It's why the Dorset Action Group has been urging Dorset Council to divest the millions their pension fund has invested in fossil fuels. Yes, pension funds must seek the best possible returns for their members, but as renewable sources of energy now make more economic sense than fossil fuels, it's obvious where the long-term smart money should go. And of course, profit is not the only criteria. To quote Sir David Attenborough, It's crazy that our banks and our pensions are investing in fossil fuels when these are the very things that are jeopardising the future we are saving for. If you're a member of Dorset Council's pension scheme, you can go to dtaction.co.uk to see how you can persuade the council to change its investment strategy. Change has to come, and come soon. We consumers really do have the power to drive that change. From changing our light bulbs to our bank accounts, whatever else we can change, we can help to create a future everyone can enjoy. Pat Osborne of Labour writes... Over the past couple of months, both the Tories and the Labour Party have started to set out their stalls for the next general election, which is likely to be sometime in 2024. There are three key things that should be shouting out to voters about Labour's five missions versus Sunak's five pledges. First, Sunak's pledges are characteristically focused on the short term between now and the next election. Labour's missions unapologetically recognise that the chaotic mess the Tories have created over three electoral terms will take more than one term to fix. Second, Labour is ambitious in its missions to become a clean energy superpower by 2030 and secure the highest sustained growth of any G7 country. In comparison, Sunak's pledges lack any kind of ambition for the UK. His economic focus is narrowly configured around marginal gains in growth, maintaining rather than reducing the cost of living, and making small inroads into reducing the national debt, none of which helps ordinary people in North Dorset who are struggling on a daily basis with the cost of living and leaves the UK on course to fall behind Poland in terms of growth per capita within the next 10 years. Third, while both the Tories and Labour appear to acknowledge the need to improve the NHS, the remainder of their pledges and missions take on a distinctly different feel. While Labour's missions to reform the justice system and raise education standards point to long-term aspirations for a fairer and more equal society, Sunak's focus is on continuing to other people who arrive on our shores in boats seeking a better life for themselves and their families. While it's clear that Labour will also need to get to grips with the asylum crisis that endangers people seeking a better life, bedevils seaside economies dependent on tourism, and has been proven negligent in its care of unaccompanied children, Sunak's focus on immigration is nothing less than a cynical appeal to the right of his crumbling and ill-disciplined party that reeks of desperation. Anyone that sings a bit of country has my heart. Dorset Island Discs. As event organiser at the Turnpike Show, Shepherd Bonnie Craddock is facing a doubly busy spring, thanks to one overexcited, fun loving ram. Bonnie Craddock rolls her eyes as she spots a ewe lambing out of the office window. Last year I had them timed perfectly. Lambing began the week after the Spring Countryside Show, but a ram got into the flock and enjoyed himself, and so here I am, unintentionally lambing in February. The 27-year-old shepherd from Ludwell near Shaftesbury has a flock of 1,200 sheep, which she shares with her brother, Matt. Add to that her second job of organising two of Dorset's major country shows, and she keeps herself busy. Lambing is, as she says, Hardest part of the job, but the most rewarding. 
My days start at 4.30 a.m. and I arm myself with a thermos of coffee. We rent our land so our flocks are spread around. We stretch from lambs in beer regis to breeding ewes in fovent and everything in between. It can take five hours to check on them all. I've been working for the past few years for the Gillingham and Shaftesbury show, and I now do that almost full time. I love it. As an agricultural show team, everyone's very understanding if I turn up late for work because I've had an unexpected sheep situation. The spring countryside show means April is a crazy month. The early lammers will be finished shortly, and then I'll be working flat out on the show before going straight into 10-hour lambing days, and I thought a career in the army would be hard work. Despite growing up on a dairy farm, Bonnie was determined the army life was for her. Having passed officer selection with flying colours, Bonnie did her A-levels at Welbeck Sixth Form Defence College. Ironically, it was her beloved sheep which caused an end to her military career. An old shoulder injury caused by five-year-old Bonnie moving sheep with Matt didn't appreciate her playing rugby and polo for the army and Bonnie was discharged. For the past four years, Bonnie has been sheep farming, working with her more experienced big brother. A life in music, and so to Bonnie's eight music choices, in no particular order, along with how and why they've stuck with her. Number one, rocking all over the world, status quo. This reminds me of too many hours spent singing and dancing to it with my dad while either decorating a house or doing mundane cleaning jobs. It never fails to make the tedious tasks that much easier. Emo Girl by Machine Gun Kelly. Don't ask. Well, that is literally what we're doing here, Bonnie. I don't even know why I love it, but I can sing along to the whole thing and it's definitely one of my top songs. And that's a fact. I just checked my Spotify stats. Air Hostess by Busted. I have too many memories of awful dancing to this with friends when I was younger, but that's what I love about it. Every time I listen to it, it's packed with all those memories of carefree, awful dancing young me. Life is a Highway, Rascal Flats. Whenever I'm feeling blue, this is the song that gets put on. And with zero apologies to anyone with an earshot, it's on repeat until I feel lifted. Truth hurts, Lizzo. Oof. I'm not sure that anyone who has had to deal with a certain type of man needs this explained. Why men great till they gotta be great? Yes. Hooked on a feeling, Blue Swede. I know it's old, but I first heard this song while watching Guardians of the Galaxy, and I couldn't get it out of my head for weeks. It just makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. I haven't told my other half this but this is the song I'd want our first dance to be. It's so upbeat, and it's how he makes me feel. Maybe don't include that bit? Oops, I think we just did. Sorry, Bonnie. Soul by Lee Bryce. To be honest, anyone that sings a bit of country has my heart. If you haven't heard it, give it a listen. I can't even say how happy this song makes me. If you hear me listening to it, you know it's been a very good day. I am a cider drinker by the Wurzels. Would it even be a Dorset Island Discs with a young farmer if this wasn't included? Many, many memories of great nights, often in muddy fields, surrounded by hundreds of people all singing along to this. It's something everyone should experience. OK, what about a book for your days as a castaway? Anything on the Greek gods. I'm currently reading a couple of books on the history of them and trying to follow all the storylines and keeping track of who's related to who would definitely make the time go by. And a luxury item? A sleeping bag. I'll be fine on the island. I could actually do with some peace and quiet. As long as I've got something warm to cover me, I'll be grand. Which one to keep? If a giant wave was coming and there was only time to snatch one record, which would Bonnie save from the water? Hooked on a feeling, obviously. Logging on to horsepower. It may be 10,000 years old, but Toby Hode believes the ancient skill of horse logging is vital in shaping and saving our woodlands. Tracy Beardsley reports. He's been up since 4.30am on daddy duties for his five and seven-year-olds. He's cooked a full English, got his two horses into a truck, driven 20 miles, and is now about to walk more than four miles with the horses, each of which can pull up to one and a half times their body weight. This is the world of Toby Hode, one of only 12 full-time horse loggers in the country. As we sit chatting on a pile of logs, looking out on an idyllic ancient woodland with the soundtrack of horses munching hay, 
no full English for them, and the tintinabulation of harnesses, I can see why Toby gets so much job satisfaction. Aside from the travelling, he covers Dorset and all the surrounding counties, there's no negatives to what I do, he says. It's physically hard, but that's invigorating. My workforce are my best employees. They never want a pay rise nor demand a pension. He's talking about his three sturdy comtois, Etty, Céline and Fleur, French mountain draft horses known for their steady and sociable natures. Their powerful bodies with short, strong legs are perfect for forestry work and in their native land, ploughing vineyards. Toby explains their stature allows them to work on steep slopes so they can get to where the machinery count. Comtois are such all-rounders, hard-working as well as hardy. They don't even need shoes as their feet are tough. Most of the time they have a lovely nature too. I'll admit that Etty, the lead mare, can get grumpy, but we all have bad days. Toby started horse logging 14 years ago, after exploring many other occupations. Sail making, sheep shearing, dry stone walling, green woodworking, making charcoal. I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I never felt pigeonholed. I just tried lots of different things. I loved learning. The only thing I was sure of is that I wanted to work outdoors. Toby tried an experience day with a horse logger and that was it. The moment I started working with his horse, I knew I'd found my direction. With a mix of modern machinery, chainsaws, a hydraulic forwarder to stack the timber, a mobile sawmill, combined with his eight legs of horsepower, Toby offers complete project management, felling trees, stacking logs, sawing them and selling them on or using them again in the woodland. At his present job, the logs are being reincarnated into a bird hide on the estate. The National Trust employs Toby every summer on heathlands for bracken rolling. His horses pull a roller with L-shaped bars, which bruise the invasive bracken. The crushed plants must then put energy into recovering rather than growing, so their spread diminishes each year. Without the use of any chemicals, grass will eventually take over, and the Trust will be able to graze native cattle back on the heathland. The beauty of using agile horses is I can work on sites of architectural interest, which forbid machinery, and in sensitive areas to protect fauna and flora, as there's less impact. He shows me the faint track, which is the only trace that's been left by his horses. With its low impact approach, horse logging definitely has an important role to play in our natural future. It's time to harness up again. He needs to be out of the woods before the nesting birds settle later this month. His employees are getting twitchy too though with a few voice commands, Etty and Celine are ready for work again. They're like me, Toby says. If I don't work for a few weeks, I get restless. I just want to get back into the woods with my horses. And you can read more on that at dorsethorselogging.co.uk and you can see Toby and his horses in action at the Turnpike Showground, Mockham, in the Spring Countryside Show on the 22nd and 23rd of April. And that's all we have time for in episode one of the March BV magazine podcast. Join us again next week for episode two. Until then, it's goodbye from me, Terry Bennett. And it's goodbye too from me, Jenny Devitt.